Hello, my name is Dr. Jennifer Lightdale. I am the Director for Quality and Patient Safety in the Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition at Boston Children's Hospital and an Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard University. In conjunction with Drs. Douglas Fishman and Jeannie Wong, my pediatric GI colleagues at NASPAGAN, it is my pleasure to welcome you to IQ equals E, Improving Quality in Endoscopy, the Endoscopy Module. This is a presentation that can be used as an MOC Part 4 activity for accreditation from the American Board of Pediatrics. I have no disclosures. Gastrointestinal endoscopy involves the examination of the inside of the upper gastrointestinal tract using a lighted flexible instrument called an endoscope. Generally speaking, gastrointestinal endoscopy is used to diagnose, monitor, and treat a whole host of gastrointestinal disorders in people of all ages. Upper GI endoscopy is the most common endoscopic procedure performed in children and is considered feasible to perform in pediatric patients of all ages, including neonates, school-aged children, and adolescents. Quality in endoscopy is established by ensuring the procedure is safe and efficient, is used effectively to make proper diagnoses, can essentially exclude other diagnoses, minimizes adverse events, and is accompanied by appropriate documentation from beginning through end of the procedure, including documentation of timely communication of all results, including those that come from obtaining biopsies. This NASPAGAN sponsored MOC module involves a curriculum designed to help all GI physicians and surgeons to identify gaps in current performance of pediatric endoscopy. In turn, the module is designed to help promote quality in care. Common methods for improving quality in healthcare include the identification of benchmarks and standards, the provision of additional training and education, the performance of self-evaluation and reporting, and engagement in continuous quality improvement processes. Quality in endoscopy can be promoted by adhering to various established metrics for procedural documentation. These metrics have been devised from recommendations of various regulatory bodies, including the Department of Health and Human Services Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, as well as the Joint Commission as well as those made by various task forces in gastroenterology societies, including NASPAGAN, the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, the American Gastroenterological Association, and the American College of Gastroenterology. Generally speaking, pediatric procedural documentation is intended to maintain standards upheld in documentation of open surgical procedures, as well as procedures in adults. Whenever possible, they are evidence-based. Endoscopic procedure quality should be assessed at each time point of a procedure. Strictly speaking, it often begins in the clinic with referral for the procedure and ends after patients have left the procedural unit. Nevertheless, documentation that reflects the quality of each time point in the procedure is an imperative and must relate to critical elements of the pre-procedure process, the intra-procedural events, and post-procedural communications. Pre-procedural elements that can be used to assess the quality of documentation of pediatric gastrointestinal endoscopy include clear mention of the procedural indication, discussion of informed consent, including discussion of risks, benefits, and alternatives to the procedure, evidence that the endoscopist performed a pre-procedure assessment, either by documentation of a physical exam or by noting the patient's ASA status, as well as evidence that the endoscopist established a plan for how sedation would be achieved, even if that routinely involves an anesthesiologist-administered regimen, as I know many people have. Major interprocedural elements include a full description of the procedure performed, delineation of any findings with specific mention of anatomic landmarks, quantification of estimated blood loss, and note of any complications. Post-procedural elements that should be clearly documented to ensure a reflection of the quality of the procedure includes a cataloging of any patient recommendations post-procedure, as well as documentation of all results of the procedure, and those results were communicated. Uh, so this would include both at the time of endoscopic impressions and pathology results.
large multi-center studies of quality of endoscopy reports have shown clear gaps that may benefit from improvement. In particular, investigators examined data from the Cl Clinical Outcomes Research Initiative, or CORI project, of more than 400,000 procedures over a two-year period, and they found tremendous variation in reporting, with many basic elements of procedural reports found to simply be missing. Similar preliminary data from PEDS CORI network looked at 20,000 cases and showed similar variation in documentation. Of course, training in endoscopy represents a critical time to teach best practices around not only performing procedures, but also about how to document them. Recent pediatric guidelines stipulate that trainees must aim to know appropriate indications, contraindications, and alternatives to procedures appearances of both normal and abnormal findings, and how to select and apply appropriate sedation strategies and equipment. High quality documentation of a procedure from both trainees and experienced endoscopists should routinely reflect attainment of each of these goals. The goals of training in endoscopy are to perform procedures safely, completely, independently, and expeditiously. You should also be able to accurately interpret and describe findings, to integrate endoscopic findings into management plans, to recognize and manage complications, and to effectively communicate both the endoscopic and pathologic results of procedures to patients and to other clinical providers. As we transition from trainee to faculty, these competencies should be maintained, and their application must be reflected in all documentation in the medical record. Identifying gaps in performance or in quality documentation of performance is critical to improving pediatric endoscopic practices. In terms of pre-procedure elements of performing and documenting quality endoscopy in children, indications for performing upper endoscopy in children can be both diagnostic or therapeutic and should be made clear to both patients and other providers before the procedure is performed. Another critical element of the pre-procedure phase of a quality endoscopy is to show evidence that the endoscopist assessed the patient. One way to do this is to document the ASA status, even if an anesthesiology colleague has also made note of this in their procedural documentation. Indeed, one of the most important preoperative assessments is relating patient risk factors for a given procedure to the proposed plan for sedation. In turn, the American Society of Anesthesiologists has established suggestions for their non-anesthesiology colleagues to classify their patient's physical status. This classification system is commonly used as a metric of patient complexity and serves as a common language among clinicians as they discuss patients in terms of disease severity. One caveat that endoscopists should be made aware of regarding ASA is that anesthesiologists may be inclined to label more patients as ASA2 when compared with endoscopists. This appears to be because they routinely consider reflux in their decision making, despite the fact that reflux is clearly not in and of itself a systemic disease. More caveats of ASA classification is that the system is really one of crude patient categories and it does not adequately capture complex clinical scenarios. For this reason, it may be very appropriate and useful to also document a patient's comorbidities. Nevertheless, ASA class has been clearly associated with increased risk of adverse events in both adults and children. In turn, it may be useful in endoscopic risk stratification, leading several of the adult GI societies and the National Quality Forum to agree that its documentation should be considered an important quality indicator for endoscopy. Informed consent is the final critical element of the pre-procedure phase of a procedure. The American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy has defined informed consent as, quote, voluntary agreement by a person with the capacity for decision making to make an informed choice about allowing an action proposed by another person. Strictly speaking, informed consent in the modern era of healthcare is both an ethical and legal requirement and is required nationally prior to the performance of endoscopy in children. Of course, by definition, obtaining informed consent in pediatrics almost always involves parents or legal guardians to provide consent. Such representation may also be involved in incapacitated patients.
state laws should be used to determine the age at which patient, pediatric patients can give legal consent, or what exact capacity a patient requires for decision making. In addition to consent, assent should be obtained in older children when appropriate. An informed consent must be considered an ongoing procedure in the sense that neither the endoscopist's mandate to communicate fully about risks and benefits, nor the patient's decision making stops once the form is signed. Importantly, informed consent only covers a specific procedure and does not cover anything that is not discussed. Across the entire process, the goal is real patient and parent understanding, which is quite difficult to attain, but the goal should be to achieve it. In terms of what needs to be conveyed, informed consent should include either what is called, quote, professional disclosure, or else what would be expected by a reasonable patient standard. Professional disclosure is defined as that which a colleague in the same situation would give either to another clinician or to a lay person themselves. Information within disclosure should include a patient's medical diagnosis and results, the proposed procedure and the reason for doing it, the benefits anticipated by performing the procedure, any risks the endoscopist has considered as they prepare for the procedure, as well as possible complications or adverse events that a reasonable patient should expect to know might be encountered during the procedure. Finally, patients should be advised as to any alternatives that might exist to doing the procedure, as well as their prognosis if the procedure is declined. Indeed, while the safety of performing upper endoscopy in children has been well established, it is important to recognize that performing upper endoscopy in children is inherently risky. To this end, peds Corey data from more than 10,000 procedures found an overall rate of complications to be 2.3%, in this study, risks of hypoxia from sedation-related events were most common, with a rate of 1.5%, while the risk of bleeding was second most common, at 0.3%. The peds Corey data has also yielded findings that suggest characteristics of patients that are most at risk for complications during pediatric upper endoscopy. These include patients that are younger and those with higher ASA classes. Finally, the presence of a trainee during a procedure may be more associated with complications. There are few contraindications for performing endoscopy in children. New ASGE standards of practice for pediatric endoscopy state the only relative absolute contraindication may be when bowel perforation is suspected, but even this is truly relative, as are most others. Nevertheless, some high-risk situations should involve a clearly documented risk-to-benefit discussion. These may include patient size, as well as small premature neonates, in particular those less than 2 kilograms, who may be at risk for respiratory compromise when the stomach is distended, patients with coagulopathies, which may increase their risks from biopsies, those with neutropenia, which may increase their risks of infection, and those with acute cardio and or pulmonary disease. So, if we put it all together, quality informed consent is reflected by documenting that the physician explained the nature and purpose of the procedure, the probable risks and benefits, any rare or unusual risks which a reasonable person would want to know may be experienced, any alternatives to performing the procedure, as well as the risks of refusing care. It is possible to directly relate each of these to specific procedures. In the case of a diagnostic endoscopy with biopsies, these include to obtain information by visualizing the mucosa of the upper gastrointestinal tract, and that both visual and directed sampling of the mucosa should provide this. Risks of the procedure are rare, but do include bleeding, perforation, and exposure to infectious disease. The alternative would be to not perform the procedure, but this would entail not gaining information that can only be obtained by visualizing or sampling the mucosa. In terms of ensuring high quality pediatric endoscopy, we next consider critical interprocedural elements. Here, we will focus our discussion on typical upper GI endoscopy, which involves direct inspection of the esophagus, stomach, 
duodenal bulb and the duodenum, and is called an esophago-gastro-duodenoscopy, or EGD. In turn, high-quality procedures are reflected in documentation that attest to inspection of all of the upper GI tract and differentiates which involved examination by visualization only and which involved mucosal sampling with biopsies. As complete inspection is really the key to quality endoscopy, all endoscopists are encouraged to use four-way directional tip control to assure it. It can be helpful to examine anatomic components that make up a complete inspection in a routine way. For example, it can be helpful to always traverse the esophagus, almost immediately retroflex to inspect the cardia, then advance to the duodenum, and then withdraw to inspect the antrum. Patient position can also impact the quality of pediatric endoscopy. The preferred position is left side down in the left decubitus position. A supine position should only be considered safe in pediatric patients with protected airways, as defined as patients who have their airway protected by endotracheal intubation during anesthesiologist-assisted deep sedation or general anesthesia. At least one study has shown higher rates of microaspiration during upper endoscopy in supine patients who have received deep sedation but have no endotracheal tube. The preferred method of endoscope insertion when performing quality endoscopy with or without endotracheal intubation is direct visualization of all of the structures in the pharynx, including the palate, epiglottis, arretinoids, and vocal cords. The esophagus should be partially distended to look for abnormalities and also identify anatomic landmarks, such as the Z-line. The stomach should be considered as three areas, the fundus, corpus, and antrum. Most quality upper endoscopic procedures advance to the third part of the duodenum, past the major papilla, which demarcates the second part. According to new guidelines, biopsies should be obtained if patients have an underlying immunocompromised state, if irregular or deep ulcerations of the mucosa are seen, if there is proximal distribution of esophagitis, or a mass lesion, or an irregular appearing stricture. Biopsies are very safe, but inherently involve increased risks, especially of bleeding and perforation. Regarding biopsies in pediatric endoscopy, the standard of care is to obtain them routinely, even in the absence of specific findings. This is different from adult endoscopy and is based in part upon the risk-to-benefit calculation that the risks and costs of performing repeat procedures in the pediatric population outweighs the risks of obtaining biopsies. It is important to note that several studies have found it difficult to rule out clinically significant disease in children based on endoscopic appearance. For example, Kaku and colleagues examined the correlation between endoscopic and histologic findings in 167 children undergoing endoscopy for peptic symptoms. A little more than a quarter of patients were felt to have endoscopic evidence of gastritis, but found to have normal pathology. In those patients with no findings endoscopically, 60% had evidence of gastritis on histology. Only erosive disease was associated with high endoscopic to histologic correlation. In terms of obtaining biopsies, it is important to recognize that certain conditions may be patchy in distribution, for example, gastritis. In turn, biopsy protocols may benefit from standardization. An example of one system for increasing diagnostic yield is the Sydney system, which suggests five locations in the stomach. In terms of celiac disease, the AGA recommends four to six proximal small bowel biopsies from parts one through four of the duodenum. There has been growing evidence that diagnostic yield of pediatric celiac disease may be increased if the duodenal bulb is biopsied, but clear guidelines are still pending. In the post-procedure period, there are several critical elements to ensuring high endoscopic quality. In particular, ensuring and documenting clear communication on the day of the procedure is important. At that time, it is possible to comment on endoscopic findings, but it is also important to convey that pathology has been sent and is pending. 
Communication later of pathology findings is a fundamental responsibility associated with performing endoscopy in children. As with all pathology, this is particularly true if the biopsy suggests disease or unfavorable diagnoses. However, this responsibility is just as important when the biopsies do not show pathology. Communicating all results is crucial and will help with providing guidance regarding appropriate post-procedural follow-up. Failure to communicate pathology findings is often the result of poorly designed systems for ensuring communication practices. All endoscopists should know a priori who will be communicating the findings. The provider themselves versus a colleague who perhaps referred the patient for endoscopy versus administrative staff. This needs to be sorted out ahead of time. It should also be determined ahead of time what form communication will take and the timing for notification. Failure to communicate findings can be exacerbated if poor systems exist for documenting communication of results. This documentation can be particularly challenging as the communications are happening in an asynchronous manner with performance of the procedure. The challenges may be only currently compounded in the modern era of healthcare with many competing demands that are made on providers and the constraints of the electronic medical record and time. Designing good systems for documenting communication of pathology findings requires a careful understanding of individual workflow. The ideal system for communicating results, though, is meticulous, standardized, and sets up expectations for everyone, including the patients. For example, a practice may opt to provide a written handout during discharge from a procedural unit that gives a timeline for expecting notifications from the endoscopist regarding biopsies, identification for the patient ahead of time of who exactly will be calling them, and how to reach the office if the communication appears to have broken down. Clear documentation of communicating results should include how and when patients were contacted, whether or not they appeared to understand the, the discussion, and what follow-up was recommended. It may also be appropriate to document the provider's impression of the patient's understanding and plans for next steps. In conclusion, upper endoscopy is a fundamental tool for diagnosing GI disease in children that is generally safe but inherently risky. Performing quality procedures should be reflected in documentation that clearly shows all stages of endoscopy, including pre-procedural, intra-procedural, and post-procedural care. Patient assessment pre-procedure is critical and increasingly a nationally recognized quality metric. Obtaining informed consent must be viewed as a continuous process of promoting real patient understanding of the procedure and does not stop when the form is signed. Intra-procedural quality can be assured by understanding the indication for the procedure, devising strategies to have routine complete visualization of the anatomy, and to obtain biopsies appropriately. Finally, post-procedural communication of results occurs both on the day of the procedure and subsequently when pathology results are returned. Ensuring both occur and are reflected in the patient's chart requires meticulous, carefully designed systems that don't interfere with a busy workflow. This concludes the PowerPoint presentation on quality and endoscopy. To complete the MOC activity, we will now focus now on understanding your documentation during all phases of a procedure. It is required to submit repeated reports of clinical performance by completing a case report form for each of 10 patient cases during three separate reporting sessions for a total of 30 case report forms. You will receive clinical performance data after each session, which should help you identify gaps in your own practice, and you will then receive instruction on how to engage in a continuous quality improvement process. We look forward to working with you on this. The format for the MOC module includes this PowerPoint slide with the accompanying video that you have just watched. We also have included reference lists and a list of clinical resources. Thank you.